the way and, and add another thing. So this time we've got two cameras, one for the producer, one for the host. So <laughs> normally only one thing a night goes wrong. So if we just have one thing go, go wrong tonight, that'd be, that'd be excellent as well. But as we go around the grounds to use a footballing reference. Beautiful. We are live everywhere we need to be. So I'd like to welcome you all officially to the Oak Barrel, whether you're here in the room or here, there on the internet, in a lounge room, in a bedroom, in a pub, wherever you're watching, to something very, very special. Um, Simon, it feels like we've talk, been talking about this for about a year now, uh, because it's probably almost been a year, uh, the Australian series from the Boutique Whiskey Company. And we almost got it here a few weeks ago, and then someone decided to get stuck in the Suez Canal and push that back a little bit. But we're here <laughs> finally. We have booze in glasses and booze all around Australia and in some of the places around Australia. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to this, to this tasting. Um, if you're here in the room, our toilets are just up the back. We've got water on the table. Uh, we are, of course, doing all eight whiskies in the series, so there's a bit of booze on the table. Um, feel free to put your hand up and... Get, get some water. I'm sitting in the producer's booth here so I can uh, run and grab stuff while someone keeps talking. Um, if you are at home or somewhere else, you'll have to point at the toilets and the uh, tap for yourselves because I have no idea where that is. But I want to um, invite some special guests uh, onto the stream and firstly say g'day to, to Simon. But as we uh, go through this, we've got Gareth and Angela Andrews from the Fleurio Distillery. Hello. Um, g'day. G'day. Hello who are our Australian distillers tonight, uh, which is great because they get to pick on all the other seven Australian distillers as we go through the <laughs> <laughs> you know what they really like at the end of this. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, a name and a face that's not uh, a stranger to Oak Barrel screens, but this is his first time technically in the Oak Barrel tasting room, uh, actually larger than life. Uh, Dave Worthington, Boutique Dave, uh, looking his finest there. Mate, how are you? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, yeah, I'm on my third cup of coffee, so I'm just coming to life now. Yep. So um, it's actually getting quite cold here in, in Australia. Um, in Sydney, we've had some like 20 degree days and that sort of stuff. Um, what's it? What's, <laughs> what's dream it like? of them. Yeah. What, what's it like in the UK at the moment? We dream of 20 degrees centigrade. Yeah. Uh, what, what sort of maximums at the moment around 14, 15 um, and getting down to seven at night. So it's a little chilly outside if you're sitting outside having your pint in the evening. So when are you getting, you're getting let back into pubs soon though? You'll be able to go inside in a pub surely? Yeah, yesterday, uh, yeah, yesterday was the first day that the pubs were open and restaurants were open and yeah, everything's been slowly opening up uh, as from, from yesterday. Hospitality opened yesterday um, for inside venues. Of course, every time I've seen you over the past year, I've just seen you trapped in this room. So I guess eventually we'll allow you out of that room. That's the plan. Well, we're, you, you know, Pete and I do the tots and drams on a Thursday evening, every other Thursday evening, where Boutique Pete talks about, you know, gets me drinking rum. Um, and we've been doing him in our rooms, but we're talking about, because the venues are opening up now, so we're talking about actually recording them live from, from a venue. Um, so we do a rum venue and then a whiskey. So it'd be travelling around London doing doing bars that uh, that take boutique whiskey and boutique rum and doing sort of an event from there live, which I'm really looking forward to. I must admit. Excellent, excellent. Well, should we talk a little bit about what we're here for today? So this is the very first public tasting we have done for the Australian series for that boutique whiskey company. So we're very pleased to present all eight whiskies tonight as well. Um, it was meant to be the very, very first tasting, uh, but as uh, Scott mentioned, we did get a little delayed, but uh, that's because good things take time. Uh, and yeah, very pleased to be able to present all eight whiskeys tonight. I'm actually going to let Dave and uh, Gareth and Andrew do all the talking about the whiskey, and I'll be here to help facilitate and ask questions and run around with the mic if you have anything that you'd like to ask the guys we have up here on the screen. So Dave. Are you, are you in charge of pouring tonight then, Simon? I have, I have, well, I did help Scott with some of the pouring, yes. Oh, okay, <laughs> if you just wouldn't mind. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, I've got them all here on the windowsill. Um, yeah, good, good evening. Um, it's, um, 
It's 9.36 in the morning here in deepest mid-Bedfordshire. Yeah, my name is Dave Worthington. I am the brand ambassador for that boutique whiskey company, an all-round whiskey geek um, who gave up an engineering career to talk about whiskey because I love talking about whiskey. I love drinking whiskey as well, but I love people, love talking about whiskey. And started, oh, quite a long time ago now uh, as a part-timer writing a whiskey blog and then starting to work the whiskey shows as a volunteer um, and then being in the right place at the right time. And someone said, how would you like to do this full time, Dave? And so here I am. So, yeah, I'm delighted to be back in Australia again, back with the Oak Barrel and to present our Australia series, a collection of eight Australian whiskies. I'm going to call them all whiskies because we're not allowed to call them all whiskies here because we have this thing over this side of the pond and then you can only make whiskey in the warehouse. That has to be three years old before you can call it a whiskey. Uh, which I think is ridiculous, um, seriously. But because um, there's some great spirits that are well under three years old uh, that should be called whiskies. But yeah, we've got a collection, one rye, uh, seven single malts from distilleries that we don't hear about so much over here. There's two that I recognised when, when I saw the list um, and six that I didn't recognise because although we all know that Australian whiskey is excellent and certainly the stuff that we've been seeing over here uh, we can never get our hands on anything the only things we were seeing over here we saw a little tiny bit of Sullivan's Cove way back in 2014 <clears throat> when uh, they won the world's best single malt at that time um, and then we had a little bit of Overeem come over and Boutique actually bottled a couple of batches of Overeem and, and then it's really been quiet we see occasional casks of Bakery Hill come over um, but over the last couple of years it's been Starwood that's really been waving that flag for Australia over here in the UK and Europe in fact every whiskey show that I went to in, in 2018-2019 there was a Starwood um, table pushing Australian whiskey which is great um, and we knew how great Australian whiskey was because Dominic Roscoe the, the, the whiskey writer the Wizards of Whiskey um, award he's been banging on about craft whiskey and Australian whiskey for many many years and he introduced me to it a long long time ago and we were just desperate to get our hands on some and put them in boutique bottles basically so we could show over here how great Australian whiskey is so I'm, yeah I'm delighted that we've got this series uh, Emily Chapel is our illustrator so all of our labels you might notice are a little bit different Emily has really brought these labels to life um, I know you're desperate to get some whiskey in your glass and if you're playing the sweepstakes this morning I'll tell you when I take my first sip um, but I'd like to get um, the Dalgrove in your glass first um, I'm just going to pour myself a wee smidge of Dalgrove um, for those in the live audience that is uh, your top left number one um, and I might just jump in there and say a few days to people uh, who are watching the various channels. Uh, so whiskey is my jam. Uh, to to it's on, it's on both channels because it's everywhere. Like it's <laughs> Mark Westmoreland from the uh, Woodburn Distillery. Oh, awesome! So he's tuning in, so he's in. Uh, and quite quite importantly, Peter Bignall from Belgrave. <laughs> so, so, so no no pressure, Dave. <laughs> uh, I, I I seriously I love this lineup now. Scott, I, I normally spend a lot of time putting a line up together and Scott's mixed them up. You know, I have this theory, if we taste them all and in the right order, we should live forever. Now, now Scott's yeah. changed it up from my, uh, I've done so so far so well, you know, I'm, um, I'm 132 now. So um, yeah, it's working so far, but uh, yeah, we've mixed it up tonight, but um, it's, it's all exciting. Yeah, I, I was lucky enough to try these whiskeys about six, Seven six months ago, yeah, and they were there were samples. They hadn't been bottled yet, you know, yeah, from sampling tanks. So that's I like my initial notes is what I'm running on. So I'm not. Uh -huh. Well, yeah, so these were the samples uh, you, you know you sent uh, sent me um, uh, a while ago just after you know, just for training the staff. So the very first samples before it had been you know finished bottling. So, so we're yeah, gonna, yeah we're going to start with the Bell Grove anyway this evening. We don't live forever. Right. We'll, we'll 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 have fun trying anyway, won't we? That's the that's the main thing. Yeah. We'll have fun trying. So yeah, Belgrove. Um, it's not something I'd heard of too much over here at all. To be honest, I haven't heard the story. Um, 
and I love rye whiskey. So I was really excited in, in getting hold of this because I'm a huge rye whiskey fan. Um, they're making some great ryes over here in Europe, um, as well as, you know, the, the resurgence of rye whiskey coming back in the US again. But over in, in Europe, we don't have those same controls that uh, the US rye whiskey industry has about virgin oak, mash bills and everything. We can do 100% and, you know, 50-50 malted and unmalted rye. So having some... Belgrove rye. This is a four-year-old rye. Um, it's our first batch, obviously. Um, all of these are our first batches. Uh, the only Australian whiskey we bottled before was Overing back in 2016, 15, 16. Um, the Belgrove distillery, I don't know why I'm telling you all about Australian whiskey, because you probably know more about Australian whiskey than I do. But to me, uh, the Belgrove distillery was the first rye distillery in Australia, apparently, located in Tasmania, just north of Hobart. It's the only biodiesel powered still in the world. Uh, yeah, this, uh, this distillery built, now it really, it really does tell the story of distilling. A farmer ended up with too much grain, thought he, you know, he had a glut of grain. The story is he had uh, a, a glut of grain, thought, right, I'm gonna make some money here. Um, we can, uh, we can sell this grain. Of course, every other farm in the area also had a glut of grain that year, and uh, the grain was not worth nowhere near as much as he thought it was. So Peter decided that, well, maybe I've got all this grain. Maybe I can distill it. I've got all this rye. Maybe I can distill it. Um, and spoke to uh, Bill Lark about building a distillery. And so basically he built his own distillery on his farm um, and turned his farm into a distillery. So he's no longer doing a great deal of farming. He's got other people in doing the Belgrove farming, the Belgrove estate, um, but he's doing all the distilling, but yeah, he built his own stills. It's one of the few distilleries in the world that grows all of its own grain, malts, ferments, distills, and barrel ages on site. And he is just a cracking character. I mean, just, we've done a few video chats with some of our Australian distillers and just had a, had a great, morning chatting to Peter and going into all the details of all the nonsense that he gets up to. I mean, he really is a big, big character. So yeah, he grows all of his own rye to produce an 100% rye whiskey. He built his copper pot stills from scratch. It's direct fired with biofuel, which is used cooking oil from the roadhouse down the road. Um, and biofuel just runs just about everything at the farm, the hot water, needed for mashing and all its farm equipment, the tractors. I mean, it started off using biofuel long before the distillery to run his farm. And he goes on about that the only significant material brought onto the farm is waste cooking oil. And the main product to leave the farm is this whiskey. Um, I think uh, everyone in Australia, whether you are a, a whiskey lover and consumer or part of the industry, has that first memory of meeting Peter. So I'd like to throw to Gareth and or Angela, uh, Andrews there to see if we have any, any first meeting uh, impressions of the, the first time you met Peter. <laughs> uh, we, we've, we've met Peter on and off over uh, quite a lot of times. Um, but for me, uh, walking uh, the 2019 Oak Barrel Whiskey Fair uh, with you there, Scott, um, after uh, one of the big shows there, we all, a group of us went into the... the I suppose you call it the Chinatown yeah. district for, for a, a, a meal. And then just walking the streets of Sydney at one o'clock in the morning with Peter Bignall on the way back to the hotel. Um, no, he's a great character. He is, he's brilliant. He's really worth talking to. Um, fantastic guy. Yeah. And when we do catch up, it's great to swap notes. Um, and bottles. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I think we scored one of his hot whiskies. Yeah, last one of time. his hot, uh, uh, yeah. hot whiskies the last time. Yeah. yeah, and I think the thing that I really admire about Peter, and he's one of those distillers I really do, um, yeah, admire. He's one of my rock gods, I suppose, <laughs> of distilling. Um, he always pushes the envelope. He does unusual things that make people, that makes people think about their waste, um, like the spittoon. Uh, yeah, the, 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 the whole spit one. Yeah, yeah, where he actually distilled um, the waste product from spittoons and created it into something usable and drinkable again. So, <laughs> and that just makes people go, oh, <laughs> but it is a really, really good um it captures his creativity and his passion for 
not wasting at all. And if anyone hasn't tried that, essentially a brandy uh, from a big wine show that used to happen here, it was called Kissing Strangers. Uh, oh, yeah. That's a, right, yeah. A pre-COVID release. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but also, for those who don't know, he's also a champion uh, sandcastle sculptor. Uh, yes. Like uh, Taste of Tasmania or any Tasmanian festival is the big sandcastle in front of whatever. Chances are Peter Bignall has got his initials at the bottom somewhere. So... A very, very talented uh, one. Does he do ice ones as well? Probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I've seen some the impressive uh, sculptures at, uh, at Dark Mofo. If you ever get a chance to go down to Tassie and go to Dark Mofo, and you can go buy a cocktail from his bar, and there'll be some you know, pedal contraption there that will make you drink for you. It's, uh, <laughs> it's quite incredible. And um, oh, a real character as well, uh, which should, we should probably talk should about. probably talk about the whiskey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 I just love this. I mean, it's so peppery. I mean, when I first nosed it, it just reminded me of a of, of a, 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 te a tequila a mezcal. There was that sort of peppery spiciness coming off of it, almost that herbal edge. It's very different from uh, a malted rye that you see over here. Um, really, because I think it's down to the cast. We're getting that that spirit character coming across, because this is from an American oak recharred. Tasmanian whiskey cask so four years full maturation um, and he suspects it was a Sullivan's Cove cask the one that he sold us was he thinks um, was a Sullivan's Cove ex Sullivan's Cove cask but it's got that lovely smoky peppery herbal sort of note onto it so it's just got that background smoke in it just a hint yeah just a hint and I think that must be from the recharged cask Rather than, unless it's his his malting process um, of of the rye, I know he's been doing some unusual um, stuff with uh, smoking using different like sheep. He was trying some sheep shit and some, <laughs> some seaweed. And, um, I've tried some sheep shit smoked whiskey from Iceland, and seriously, I just took one swig of it and thought, why? And then spat it out. I mean, yeah, it's I just. Yes, I've tried both of them. Yeah, Peter's is, and I know the exactly one you're talking about, and I tried it before it was whiskey and when it was whiskey, and I can see a few people in the room nodding their heads. I think, yes, yeah, that, that gentleman there, you definitely tried it with me that day. Um, yeah, <laughs> not good. Peter's is unbelievable. Um, about two or three years off the next one, I think. Yeah. So you might have seen the, passing the bottle around the room for those in the audience. And uh, you might notice there is a, a bit of a reference to that uh, there. There's a, uh, a chef with uh, a lot of wrinkles and some foul language coming out of his mouth. There's a bit of a reference to that, uh, that whiskey. Um, I'm going to share the label there then. Dave's on it. Um, this might come up here, might uh, be answering the question. I, I can't see it initially. Uh, Regan Owen's asking a very good question. Uh, do you have any idea on, this, on the size cask? Uh, and I might follow that up by saying, is this a single cast release or is this a couple of casts put together? This is a single cast. All of these, as far as I'm aware, are single cast. So this was a batch of, what did I say? A batch of? I think so. Um, it was a batch of 309. So um, 309. So yeah, I, 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 off the top of my head, I don't know what size cask it was, whether it was a 200 or a 250 litre, or even slightly smaller. I know you use lots of different size casks over in Australia, um, more so than we do over here. Most of the stuff over here is, is, is a hoggy. Uh, nearly everything is the finest oak hoggy, obviously. Finest oak, everything is in the finest oak over here. Um, yeah, this is a four-year-old. There's the label. Um, it's the the rolling hills of the Belgrove farm. And we put on a flow chart basically of, you know, everything's on the farm. He, Belgrove farm rye, the tumble dryer, which is his malting drum. So it's a converted uh, industrial tumble dryer. The meat mincer, which is his Porteous mill, um, an industrial sewage separator. And he assured it's, it was brand new. Um, now we can, we, we, yeah, it's, it's um, it, that's his mash tun. Um, Chip shop oil for the fire, the hand built still, and continues on to cask and age, and everything is on the farm, which is why we have this flow chart. The um, the reference to the chef down there in the corner is something about a, a there's, there's a program with Gordon Ramsay coming into there. It's 
it's not meant to be we can't say it's Gordon Ramsay but it's it's a reference to a Gordon Ramsay episode down on the farm which is meant to be hilarious um and um all of our Australian labels we wanted to um a, we wanted to put something on there that wasn't too corny. So we've got the Southern Cross on every one of our labels. So that on here, it's on the, on the chef's badge there, on his, on his tunic there. Um, and wherever we knew Bill Lark had a guiding influence on there, we put a little Lark on the label. So here he is sitting on the, on the shoulder of the chef there. Um, so there's, there's little Larks on, on, on the labels where we know Bill Lark it was in the story that he had, a, had an influence. And, and so this was the, um, the influence on this label here. So it's a really lovely, bright, clean, mm. yeah, standout light label, but it's all about the flow chart of the whole process is on this farm. It's what something that Peter really wanted. You know, he wanted, the, he wanted it to be single farm estate or single estate rye or something. He wanted something on there about it. We just couldn't fit all that text on there that he would prefer to have seen. So I'm going to take my first sip now. It's 9.52. I've been desperate to try and take a little sip of this. A um, couple of people there, Dave, were talking about the, the gentle smoke note there. And I, I dare say that's coming from the rise, coming from the reaction caused by having a direct fired still um, and that sort of influence coming through. And I'd like to say that I... Came up with that all by myself, but thank you, Peter Bignall from the Gold Derby <laughs> Still for pointing that out. Yeah. I, I just love this. I love that peppery smokiness that comes through because it does remind me of um, of that tequila mezcal sort of note, which I also, in another spirit, I really enjoy, but don't um, spend enough time on it, to be honest. I'm, Mexican family, that's why. Mexican family. So I do like that. Um, does anyone from our live audience have any questions or comments they'd like to make about this? Don't be shy. Too shy. Then we'll wait. We've got a couple more whiskeys than you, and I'll try again. Yeah. I'm only <laughs> pretend. I'm only pretending to spit here. Okay. Thank you. It's just oh, every time I take it, I think, oh, just yeah, it's just um completely different from um the rides we get over here. But I really, it's just clean. It's crisp. Um, Stop sharing that one. Uh, those those smoky notes coming through there that remind me of that um, tequila mezcal sort of note, but it's that barbecue pineapple on the nose. It's and that white 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 sugar and milky chocolate, really milky chocolate on the palate later on, just comes through. Um, Dave, you mentioned there as well that uh, you know this is what, uh, Peter and the Bell Rivers is what a pioneer for rye in Australia, and I think. It goes a little bit beyond that as well because I remember running the the, the whiskey fair that Gareth and Angela were referencing, uh, and you know seven eight nine years ago it was a really hard slog for Australian whiskey, let alone an Australian rye whiskey uh, yeah. at a show dominated historically by Scottish single malts. Um, and there was a couple of times where we sort of went, okay, Peter, maybe it's a little bit early. You know, this it isn't quite making sense for our audience. And then about four years ago, it just absolutely started to click to. So not so much the you know the one percent of people who are in this room and at this tasting, but the wider whiskey community. And now you go to an Australian whiskey show, and you'll have you know four or five Australian rye whiskies of yeah. really high quality. So I think it actually goes a little bit further to the influence of what um, Peter's had on whiskey consumption in Australia, or, or you know premium whiskey consumption in Australia in the past decade is um, is hard to understate. Um, Dan, Dennis comments on the uh, on the Zoom chat here. Bogan Burnout did it, um, and if Dave, if you haven't tried uh, one of Peter's Bogan Burnout releases, uh, which is, is his attempt to make the smokiest whiskey in the world, uh, so move over Octomore, go go back to bed. Uh, <laughs> it was called Bogan Burnout. I don't, are you familiar with the term Bogan? No. Okay, so um, <laughs> is, is, it, is it Chav in no, yeah. Chav. Chav in the UK? So an Australian Chav and doing a burnout, that's pretty much uh, what the new mix smelt like. So I think it's about two or three years in barrel now and we, we're yet to try it, but uh, that's that's the next creation. Yeah. From, uh, it, was, it was the very last thing you had to try at the Whiskey Fair in 2019 or you were just ruined. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it, was, it was memorable. Was that's probably much the same as uh, Balcones Brimstone. Have you tried Balcones Brimstone? That uh, yeah. Texan Texan blue corn that's been smoked with American scrub oak. That was a was a, an experiment that went wrong, and then actually it tasted quite good. 
Yeah, put put that release on steroids and you're halfway to Bergen burnout. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's got a finish on it that seems to last overnight. You wake up in the morning and you're still tasting it. Yeah. A couple of quick questions here before we move on to this one. Uh, Matt Wooler, who has done this tasting before but he's listening in anyway, um, as Peter's here on the feed, may I ask again if there was uh, any green rye in this at all? Ah, uh, uh, yes. There is. I think there's there's a lot of what Peter's been doing in the in the certainly in the past twelve months has been a lot of green rye in a sort of Irish single pot still sort of uh, method, um, but I don't know if going back this long there was any green rye. My my uninformed guess would be probably not, um, but I'm, I'm not too sure. But we'll uh, we'll get to the bottom of that for you, Matt. Yeah. Um, yeah, we we could sit here and we we did consider having all eight distillers on this feed, but I know you guys have to get home, you know, by, <laughs> by Friday, so it didn't quite quite make sense. So we, we were doing our best to drag along anyway, but we might move on to whiskey number two. Um, which, tin shed, uh, which is tin shed, tin yes. shed, tin shed. Yes. shed. Yeah, it is whiskey number two, tin shed. Uh, hopefully, I've got it in the right order. Yep, yeah. a three year old, um, single malt matured in an ex tawny port for two years, uh, and then being finished in a Pinot Gris wine cask. Uh, it's a release of 443 bottles, so this is one of our bigger batches. Uh, and we bought this at 48% ABV. So it's glorious, glorious colour. Um, sorry, sorry Dan. I just jump in there just to um, clarify a previous thing. 20% of the grain is green malted rye, uh, according to Peter. Right. There you go. There you go. There you go. So. Green malt. Green Mr. malt. Ah. Oh. Um, I sorry. love a bit of green malt. Hmm. Okay, yeah, tin shed, three year old, two years in ex tawny port, and, and and then finished in Pinot Gris. That's the reason why we had bought it, really, because um, we'd never heard of a it's, it's an unusual finish. Um, that's one one reason why we wanted to grab a hold of this because we hadn't seen Pinot Gris in 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 whiskey before. It's a semi sweet white wine, uh, thought to be an offshoot of Pinot Noir. So this is the reason why. Um, when we met uh, Schmidty or Felix Deer, who we sent over to find all these casts, um, he, he, in fact, Schmidty was one of the key characters in introducing Felix to lots of people in Australia and said, oh, you need to talk to these. And then he would call the distilleries like, we've got boutique over here, um, which was really, really wonderful that, that, A, that some of you had heard about what boutique whiskey were doing um, and uh, were really up for playing along with us with this, with this series. So this is an Adelaide, an urban Adelaide distillery. Um, their brand is Iniquity, um, has a bit of a cult following there. Uh, what I'm told is Tin Shed creates big flavoursome whiskies using mostly X sherry and X wine casks. Uh, and being based in South Australia, where the distillery has sort of ample access to those great wine casks. And this release highlights two with that X tawny port and that X Pinot Gris finish. So it's a really unusual variety of wine cask and rarely seen in whiskey, which is, say, the reason we, we had it. Yep. Uh, and Tin Shed are perfectly poised to experiment with that variety of wine cask, all underpinned by this big oily spirit. And it is a big oily spirit. You see the all you can't see the legs on my glass, but um, yeah, it's big and oily. Lovely. Um, it is... Uh... It is the whiskey that for me took me probably the longest to get my head around. Um, so while a few people are probably doing that, I'd like to again bring in Gareth and Angela, who are also from South Australia, um, for their thoughts on this whiskey, but more importantly, just to uh, dish any dirt on on Schmidt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we, we're trying to be quiet here so that the, the show doesn't go on too long. We, yeah, we, we're on tonight because we're the quietest distillers in Australia. We just don't speak. We just... <laughs> <laughs> He's a great guy. We run into him quite a bit. We'll be with Schmitty on Thursday at NOLA for uh, another boutique show. Um, oh, what can I He's say? Good fun, it's good baby. fun. You know, we're on the phone to each other every few weeks. We have a good chin wag about a whole heap of things. And uh, we constantly rib him, of course, because we're on the other side of the map, off the ranges facing the Southern Ocean. And uh, whenever Schmitty's in the room, I always like to claim that our whiskey is, is better because we're on our side of the, of the ranges, not his side of the mountain range. So, uh, yeah, no, he's good fun. He's really good fun. 
and um, and great advice too. You know, I've called them up and asked them about bits and pieces and vice versa. And it is a, one of the things that's really good with Australian whiskey is there's there is a lot of um, collaborative, um, you know, a lot of a lot of information sharing, where you can pick up the phone and talk to someone, or they'll pick up the phone and ask you a question or two. And of course, uh, therefore, when we get together uh, at whiskey shows, um, you know, the party. It's like meeting of friends, it's even fine. regardless regardless of where you are in Australia, um, to get together face to face rather than on the phone is just fabulous. Yeah, yeah. it's it's just one of those things. You know, the the, the whiskey shows that allows the Australian distillers to get together is fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. Just uh, don't listen to his uh, advice about following football teams. <laughs> <laughs> I don't follow football, so whoever's, whoever's <laughs> team is winning, yeah. yay. Yeah. But no, he's an amazing guy. You know, he's uh, uh, he sailed his yacht uh, when he had a yacht. I don't know if he still has a yacht even. Around Australia, he's done, uh, with, with others, he's done two or three Sydney to Hobart yacht races. He's ex-Navy, of course. So, you know, straight down the line, once you see what you get, you know, no garbage. Um, great guy. Yeah. A um, couple of quick g'days as well to uh, to Crafty Fields from the uh, Craftworks Distillery and Cape is listening in tonight. Uh, and John, John Homan comments, this is massive for Australian producers, and I, and I think it is. And maybe uh, Simon and, and Dave, we're obviously seeing these releases here and yeah. we're getting very excited about them, but only half are coming to Australia. What, like where in the world is the other half going to? Well, it's, it's actually, it's less than half. We're probably looking at uh, just under a third of the releases that made their way back to Australia. I was asked before, you no, know, this is a, a little bit crazy. You know, why are you taking whiskey from Australia, sending it to the UK, bottling it, and then sending it back? Well, it was always the intention to sell this in the UK and Europe, uh, which, we, which we've done. We've had all our um, distributors uh, you know, absolutely jump on this. People like um, Le Maison du Whiskey in France, uh, Beige Floor in Spain, uh, Kirsch in Germany. So the, the whiskey has really, uh, no, really sold out incredibly quickly over there, which is really pleasing to see. And we, we've done media tastings in the UK as well, and they've been absolutely blown away by the quality of Australian whiskey. Dave can probably comment on that a bit more because he was hosting them. So, <laughs> no, Dave, what, what, was the, uh, no, what was the feedback you were getting for these whiskeys when you're doing the media? Uh, yeah, the... the the lineup. I did a press um, tasting on the release day. I think it was just after the release day with the full eight, just like this. Um, and and the comments were great. The magazine write ups, the, the the press that we got, the press coverage that we got about talking about Australian whiskey was absolutely superb. Because we don't see it over here. Very very little of it. So yeah, it went down really well. I think our biggest overseas um, shipment went to Germany, um, followed by Belgium um, and and then Spain. Um, so, yeah, there's a huge uh, interest in Australian whiskey over here. And uh, so, so, yeah, we're really proud to be flying flying that flag for, for Australian whiskey because we believe in it. Uh, Dominic Roscoe, the whiskey writer who's been championing Australian whiskey for such a long time, uh, wrote a great new art. Uh, there's a new magazine called Stills Crazy that Dominic's just released. The first issue's out there. Um, you can download this from his website. If you want a link, I'll pop one in later in the chat. Um, you can, I'll find it and I'll put it in the chat in a minute in between when someone else is talking. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a full write-up. He's done interviews with some of the distillers as well. I'm not sure how many he did, but it's it's, it's a really new, bright new magazine. And if you know Dominic Roscoe, he's been a champion for New World Whiskey and certainly good New World Whiskey. I mean, right at the beginning, certainly in Europe, he remembers talking to some of these distilleries and saying, it's dreadful, you need to do something. Because, um, you know, Scotland have had a long, long history of, of making whiskey, but then so did Australia. Um, you know, Australia had a long, long history until it was destroyed, um, probably by um, DCL, who just sort of drove the quality down and then flooded Australia with their, their brands from Scotland. But um, that's me being cynical there. Um, but yeah, fortunately, the rebirth has happened. <laughs> we, 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 will, we will do a tasting like that in when we can get the right yeah. booze, but that is there's, another story. There's, there's been some great <laughs> write ups by Australian whiskey writers as well. So um, Andrew Durbage gave it a good write up on, um, on uh, Whiskey and Wisdom. Uh, Luke McCarthy on Oz Whiskey Review did a great write up too. And also, as I was driving down here today, I was listening to um, the Whiskey Cast by Mark Gillespie. 
and he gave uh, some pretty good uh, reviews of them too. I think he uh, the Flurio he rated pretty high, highly, which we'll get to try a bit later, and the Kalara was in there as well. So um, yeah, there's three of them he gave uh, a 93 to 95, so which is awesome. Hi. It's it's been seriously well received, and uh, yeah, we're blown blown away by it as well. Let me just share the label because it's the corniest of them all. We had to do it. The down under malarkey with our tin shed label, everything upside down. Um, Ian Smitty Smith with his parrot on his shoulder, standing in front of his vine covered warehouse. The vine signifying the grapes, uh, the the wine cask that he that he that he has access to. Um, you see, we've got the Southern Cross. Uh, on the end of the barrels on this one, didn't get it in the sky. But he's standing there with his flagpole. He used to be a flagpole salesman once in his life, and so he said he had to have a flagpole on his label. Uh, his parrot, there's stories about his parrot that he trained to mimic a doorbell just to catch his wife out, and he, he, the, the parrot could mimic the doorbell on command sort of thing um, just to wind his wife up. Um, so, yeah, that's why the parrot's on there, and he's got his the brand flag, the iniquity brand flag, flying flying proudly upside down there. So yeah, we went for the full corn um, with the upside down label. It's the only one we did do the full full corniness on it. But um, I think every every everyone I, I think everyone at the distilleries, the Australian distilleries, were involved with their with the label designs. Um, uh, we we spoke to everyone and we wanted to tell little stories. I mean, every one of our labels tells stories. So this will always, if we get another batch of tin shed, this will always be the tin shed label. There will just be little changes. Normally we change just one little tiny detail um, between each batch. And so it's like, it's like a where's Wally that you're looking for, that little change between batch one and two. Um, quite like, this is a different um, tin shed for me. Like, it's, it's a different take. It's, it's the, the sweetness is a little bit different. Normally, and we've seen a few like Merlot and Shiraz casks recently, which have been a little bit different from, from Tin Shed, and they've been a little bit more grungy, you know, toffee sweetness. This is a little bit cleaner. Again, which as well, I'm, I'm starting to see this, you know, what I love about this, this series is Australian whiskey through UK eyes. You know, they were bought by a UK buyer for their flavor profiles. And we're starting to see that, that cleanliness coming through. But I know there's a lot of people in the room that have tried a bit of iniquity. So if you have any comments on, on this, it's, it's not as grungy, I don't think, as some of these, these other stuff. Keep talking, I'm typing the link. A couple of whiskeys away for that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, 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 it's amazing. As soon as you put a big TV at the front of the room, everyone is on their best behavior. I know. <laughs> Pre-COVID, you, know, you can't see you, right? It's, it's it's a riot by now, Norman. <laughs> um, but yeah, look, I think, and that's that's the like a there is a common thread. Like when you if you would lined up an official bottling from all eight of these distilleries and put it on a tasting, I would have a, a great tasting, but it'd be a very you know disparate flavor profiles. There is a common thread between all these threes because they were chosen by the same team yeah. of people and tasters, and then bottled by you know Sam and and Dave and like the team over there. So. That's what I'm, I'm going to find quite fascinating when we go through these. Excellent. Uh, I've just popped, popped a link in the chat to um, the new magazine from Dominic Roscoe. It's called Stills Crazy. I don't know if he sent it over to Australia yet, but um, yeah, it's a cracking, bright, new, free, downloadable PDF magazine. And uh, I will chuck that in all the other streams as well for the people that are interested. Uh, shall we move on to number three, which I'll just, is... gonna pop, just pop back to the bell row for a little while, but yeah, okay, uh, number three. It doesn't have the word whiskey on the bottle. It doesn't have the word whiskey on the bottle, no. No, we're not allowed to call it a whiskey over here because it's just two years old, sadly. Um, it's something I, I've had a bee in my bonnet for a little while because we bottled an 11 month old whiskey from the states which is a whiskey um but we're not allowed to call it a whiskey over here so before 1915 um anything could be labeled as a whiskey depending on you know the unaged um spirit could be listed as whiskey because that was where it was made at the whiskey distilleries um it was the immature spirits act of 1915 that brought in this three-year limit 
it was originally proposed at two, um, and the ABV at 40% proof, 40% uh, ABV came into play at 1915 because the British government at the time uh, believed that immature spirit made everyone drunk, um, which is, when you think about it, it's just ridiculous. You know, gin is immature spirit. It's not been matured. Uh, I don't think they probably had vodka around too much in, in the UK in 1915, but uh, certainly gin was prevalent in that, that time. And so this was a, it was a compromise, this three year 40% as, a, as from the government actually at the time wanted to put prohibition in place in, in, in the UK. There was a, the prime minister at the time was, was wanted prohibition. And this was sort of a, a temperance movement sort of uh, um, to put people off of this temperance movement. Um, and so this 40% three year maturation came into play then. And from, from then onwards, we're not allowed to call anything that's under three years old whiskey. Uh, and this is a two-year-old from Kalala. It's a single malt spirit, as we put on the label. And it is yes. absolutely delicious. I'm really blown away by this. And you, why can't you call this a whiskey? Look at the colour. Look at the colour of it. Uh, it's darker than a lot of our Scotch whiskies because we use a lot. You know, a lot of Scotches refill bourbon. We fill bourbon cask, ex bourbon castle egg, hoggies, and we used many, many times. I'm just trying to find something here. Here we go. Let's have a look at this one. Well, while, while you do, while you look for that, Dave, we've got a, a question from the audience just there. Shoot. Yeah, Dave. Um, I was just wondering if this whiskey was only sold back into Australia, could you call it whiskey? Because obviously, at two years, we can call it whiskey here. It is Australian spirit, so it's not claiming to be Scotch. And I just wonder why you can't call it whiskey if it's only ever sold in Australia. It's, it's uh, Australia. It's, if it was just sold in Australia, then we could have labelled it as as whiskey. If we just did it in Australian exclusive for boutique, um, we could have labelled it whiskey. Uh, because we sold it over here, we have to label it as Australian as a, a single malt spirit. Which is why we have that boutique malt company put on uh, on onto our label for this one. Um, this was one when I when I first tried, and I've been lucky enough to try a little bit of Kalara whiskey and 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 spirit before. It was in two years old, and the quality of the spirit has always been exemplary. Um, a lot of the Kalara stuff is sold direct, so you don't see too much of it in the, the bars and, and pubs or in retails. You don't see a huge amount of there. Um, but when you do get the hands on it, it's, it's a really classic um, spirit. And I think this is a, a great example of it because the cask has been very subtle yeah. on this. It's yeah. not yelling at it. Yeah, it's, uh, so it's just two years old. Uh, it's been an, an export cask. It's very, very small release, just 130 bottles at 49% ABV. Uh, this was distilled in the garage before the distillery was actually built. So it's a, it's a pre-release. Sorry, we, we, we're just doing some dancing here to get him back in focus. After that. <laughs> ah. it's, it's one of the cameras here. It, it's, um, it actually goes by looks. So now that we've had the crowd, it's come back, so that, that's not as good looking, so it's put about a focus. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, Gareth and Angela, I, I saw some nodding heads there uh, when you were when you were nosing this. What's what's your impression on, on this first impressions? This team really produces beautiful, clean, balanced spirit. And like you said, it really the spirit is speaking, not just the barrel. And I think that's really important for any whiskey. When you are filling um, first filled barrels, the barrel generally dominates whatever is in there. Um, whereas this is just, the spirit is shining through it. Mm, that's lovely. Um, I always like to raz up uh, Christy whenever we mm -hmm. meet. Uh, I refer to her as uh, your highness or your majesty being the, the daughter of the <laughs> And she takes it all in good fun. <laughs> um, but yes, no, it's it's lovely. You know, one of the things with uh, I think with a lot of Australian whiskies uh, over the last few years um, is the use of first fill barrels, of course. Um, and 
Farrell can just smash any mock character out of the room, um, just just on the strength of the oak. Um, and to, to be able to try and balance um, your oak and your spirit um, can be quite difficult um, to the point, I think, where I suppose a lot of us now, eventually you go to, um, to mash in for a brew day and you're, you're eventually deciding um, what mock bill you're going, what to, mock bill you're going yes. to use or, or, or what you're going to do based on what barrel you know it's going to go into. So you, you might run a, a different mashing regime or a different mock bill um, to for, fit the barrel for a bourbon, ex bourbon barrel or a second fill barrel, um, where the malt profile is going to shine a lot better compared to say a first fill barrel, where the just the strength of um, that ex tawny or ex apira cask is just going to smash um, any malt character out of the room, uh, and this is delicious. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I haven't heard too much of that. I don't no. know, Dave, if you've heard much about that of distillers actually tweaking malt bills for, for barrel types and, and reacting on the fly. Um, a little bit over here with, with, with some of the newer distilleries, absolutely. Certainly the distilleries that are looking at bringing back or working with heritage grains rather than just the, the standard high yield um, barley grains. I mean, there's a, a distillery not too far from here called the Oxford Artisan Distillery that has their own agro arc archaeologist something he's growing grains that are effectively illegal um, because they're not registered as barleys that should be grown for making making whiskey um, I just wanted to show you the two color this is the two-year-old Kalawa here just two years old this is a 31 year old scotch sitting alongside it <laughs> refill I, you can see my hat through there <laughs> yeah um, yeah you got a uh, if you have a second fill bourbon barrel, they're, they're just weak tea, you know. You can put whiskey into a second fill bourbon, ex-bourbon, and they, they just come up so light. You, the, the, the Kalar example, you, you know, we've got here, um, a first fill barrel, a 100 litre first fill barrel can get that sort of colour within less than two months. Mm. You know, that colour comes on first, well before the spirit has lost its um, new makiness, well before. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. The uh, yeah, we've released some. I mean, yeah, the colour comes almost instantly from the cast, doesn't it? I mean, we've had some very, very young. The youngest we've ever released is um, eleven months at the moment, and that's a, a rye and a, and, a, and a bourbon, and they are you know virgin oak, so you get big punchy colours just eleven months. But we can't call them. We can call them a bourbon, and we can call them a rye, but we can't call them a whiskey. Well, look, we've we've seen just in in very small experiments that we've done. Um, fortified Merlot casks can pull colour in five hours. Like five hours later, you're looking at it going, that's ridiculous. Mm. Wow. I remember talking to Chip Tate about this at Balconies. Absolutely. Mm. What was the selection process? Um, well, we sent our buyer over to Australia, uh, Felix Deer. Uh, he travelled the length and breadth of, of Australia, meeting distillers, um, sleeping on couches, and... Um, just sitting in warehouses with the distillers, tasting whiskey, and that is how we chose the casks. Um, they were tried at the early stages. Uh, certainly, well, no, they were tried at full maturation, and then they we don't ship them in cask. Um, we ship them in in tankers, in in inert containers to ship them back across from Australia. Yeah, the, Felix tried them all, and we have a few extra ones, as, as Gareth and Angela alluded to earlier, that there's another cast that we bought, and it will be coming out a little bit later this year. Uh, just another question from the crowd coming up, up here. Um, and just on that, um, it was great to uh, have, if, you, if anyone saw Felix at the Whiskey Fair, I slipped a little GPS tracker into his back pocket <laughs> so I could see which distillery he was talking to, uh, which gave me the, uh, the heads up when uh, I needed to place orders. <laughs> A uh, question from the audience. I don't know your camera quite goes that way, so you have to. Thanks. Um, two, two questions. One around um, whether Boutique Whiskey Company actually ever buys you make spirit from the start and puts it in your own barrels. And then secondly, um, I'm assuming you try and pick the best barrels from, from the stock of the distillery. So keen to hear from um, Gareth and Angela about what the incentive is 
for the distiller to offer up their best barrels as part of an independent release? Uh, well, that one is very simple. We just pulled out the crappiest stuff we wanted to get rid of. And, <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> not, not really. We, um, at any given time, you have, um, uh, you know, you have a selection of barrels that you're going through uh, that have reached maturity. You know, there are times, you know, lead up to Christmas, for example, we've got a big table set up and we have 35 barrels. Uh, samples from 35 barrels, all but mature. But we graded them. Um, and you've got to go through grade barrels, work out what you want to do with bits and pieces. Um, we can talk more about our barrel later, but it, it's it's just a case of, well, for us, I can only really speak for us, is that at any given time, we know we've got quite a few barrels that are up and coming. And so we can go, hey, go in there and, and have and a selection. Select. Yeah. I, I don't think they would mind. Um, Brooke and Jules from Whiskey and Almond. I don't know if you know Whiskey and Almond down in Melbourne. Um, I'm going back a few years ago when Brooke came to have a look at, at uh, possibly selecting a barrel for a, a Whiskey and Almond release. Um, at that time, 20, they were after. They're after 20, so we lined up 17 different barrel samples uh, along the cellar door there. And that, Brooke went through all of them. She just went through the whole lot and decided which one she wanted. So, yeah, that's all good fun. Uh, Brooke, Brooke Hayman, obviously the reigning Australian malt whisky tasting <laughs> champion. Uh, yes. For the last three years, because last year's event was cancelled, uh, coming up <laughs> in June, July, the next one. Yeah. There was 14 tickets left as of yesterday, I think so. But yeah, um, if, if you're going to get anyone to, to pick a car sample, Brooke's a very, very good option. Yeah. And somebody was almost certainly not going to be booked this year. So. Yes, <laughs> yes. So I'm, I'm not going to say exactly why, because I think it's my news to tell, but yeah, the, uh, the crowd will move on this year. <laughs> yeah. As an independent, and the other question that was asked is, do we buy New Make Spirit? As an independent bottler, at the moment, we don't buy New Make Spirit. When we first started, just under nine years ago, we were just buying mature stock. That's all we had the access to. We had no bottling plant. We had no warehouse. We had no licenses for holding stock. Uh, we bought casks. We popped it in with another independent bottler or a bonder and had them bottled for us. Sometimes we shared that cask with another company. And that's why some of our batches were very, very small right at the beginning. But over the years, we've, we've grown. So we're, say we'll be nine in September this year. <clears throat> and we bottled most of the Scotch whiskey distilleries. I keep going on about this 95 established single malt distilleries. And that's everything that's currently open and operating that was operating before 2005. So Kilhoman being the youngest and Strathmill, Strathila being the oldest one there. We've bottled um, 78 of those 95. Now, most of our Scotch comes from bond, bonded warehouses. So brokers because Scotch whisky industry is unique in that it was built upon, upon the back of blended Scotch whisky. So these brokerages have been in operation for many, many years, supplying independent bottlers and blenders, basically. So not every distillery has access to peated whisky, and so they have to buy peated whisky from a bonder, for example. Or they do this interchanging of swapping whisky from, you know, new make spirit from one distillery to another. That all goes on as well. So a lot of our scotch comes from bonders, but also we buy a lot of um, older scotch from uh, private collectors, really because of the, the whiskey lock in the 1980s uh, with, with companies, distilleries, selling new make spirit basically at that time um, really to raise cash because there was a cash flow issue. And so they would hold on to these, you know, a lot of our old Port Ellens, a lot of our old Macallans, um, a lot of our old Springbanks, all, yes, yeah, Springbank were selling cars because they went into a production period where they had to moth, were going into mothballing it, the, the distillery. So we bought them from private collectors and certainly from a lot of the closed distilleries, our, our batches of um, little mills, for example, so, uh, have come from private collectors. Um, now, the distilleries, you know, because we've been around for a little while, we can buy whiskies direct from distilleries in Scotland. Um, it's always difficult to begin with at first. If you remember, a lot of these Scotch distilleries are owned by multinationals and trying to, you know, big, big corporate companies trying to get to the right people to release a cask is a, is a long process. But that sort of thing has, the doors have opened to us now. We can buy direct from distilleries. Sometimes we're not allowed to name them, though. So that's when we get these unnamed whiskies that we release is because we're buying stock direct from the manufacturers 
um, young stock that um, that we can age now because we have a bottling facility and we have a warehouse with a license that allows us to re-rack uh, and, and store whiskey at and, and age. Uh, we haven't gone into buying new make spirit yet, as far as I'm aware. Um, it's something that we may be looking at now, but we know now we have a facility in Edinburgh that allows us to, to store, mature and bottle, uh, which we didn't have four or five years ago. Uh, we were reliant on other people. Um, there's a bit of a story behind this, uh, this label, uh, speaking on um, Clara. Yeah, on the, on the things, just uh, if you want to bring that one up. Um, and I'll put you another to, uh, to Matt Wooler, who's he's listening on the Facebook, um, who actually, I believe, came third. He's the third in the Whiskey Chasing Champions. Right. Surprised we have no Monty Python, Bruce the Philosopher cross references. Uh, potentially missed a keen opportunity and probably litigation too. Uh, so maybe if you can get uh, not being sued, you can try that on another distillery okay. in the future. <laughs> yeah, yeah, here's the Kalara label because Christy originally wanted to be an air traffic controller. It's something that she she was interested in. And I think she took all the, the necessary qualifications and was actually offered a position to to be an air traffic controller, but um, distilling, she, she grew up around distilling. You know, she's the, I think she's the first, second generation Australian to have their own distillery um, uh, of, of the new wave of Australia. So we've, we've got her in her control tower. Uh, everything is copper, the, the screens are all showing blueprints of the distillery, of a distillery, you know, cause she was, when we, when we met Christy, um, she was still designing and building the distillery. The still equipment was in her garage. Um, we've got all the stills as planes flying in. Um, we've got the Southern Cross in the background and you can see the little lark sitting on the screen looking proudly on, which is, um, it's, it's, I, I think it's a really lovely little touch that we've hidden this little lark everywhere on, on the labels. You've got to look for it on here. It's quite dark label, but um, a night sky. And that's our first batch of Kalala. Very nice. Yeah, I think Emily on. has done a cracking list of labels. I mean, all the labels just look fabulous this year. Really do like. And we've got this little banner across the bottom about the Australia series because previously we had no, we just bottled it and launched it, you know, and there was very little thought about what we're not what we're doing. I mean, we knew what we were bottling was great stuff, but we didn't have anything behind it, no marketing behind it. And we're just swamping um, whiskies out. So um, there you go. We're back on it now. We're back on it now with a full marketing information pack to go with every release that we have now. Okay, whiskey number four. Yes. Almost halfway through. This is our Starwood. So this is the one we have seen over here. It's a little unusual for the Starwoods that we see over here because most of the stuff that we get over here is a lot lower. This is at cast strength at 56% ABV. It is a, another three-year-old. We bottled this at 56% ABV and it was on the second biggest release at 424 bottles and it's from a Recharge X red wine cask. Again, cracking colour for a three-year-old. This is you know active casks rather than tired cask, which is why scotch has to be aged for a little bit longer. Yeah, it's certainly um, from the cask selections that they've been using. But um, Starwood Distillery is a Melbourne distillery. Uh, David Vitale is a big friend of um, Boutique Whiskey, Uncorked Whiskey Sessions, the podcast that we do. He's been on a, our podcast a few times. And he wanted to be a brewer, a, a craft brewer originally. And that's where he started, um, Tasmania, um, doing craft brewing and uh, went on to distilling. And they've probably been, they, they certainly have been the one, the biggest dis distillery that's been waving their flags over here in, in Europe and certainly in the UK. They predominantly use Australian X red wine barrels, favoring that a Barossa Shiraz, which is like this one here. And David always says their whiskey isn't intended to be a fireplace sipper. Um, it's for cracking open with good company around the dinner table. It's a it's a it's a session whiskey, and it, yeah, it's it's very very drinkable. It's sweet and agreeable and balanced, and 
even at 56 percent it's up um, so 10 30 in the morning yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, but Simon, you would have probably consumed and sampled more starwood releases and barrel samples and stuff than, than most where is when you first try this like what's your first impressions of, of this release well, I mean, for me, it did like immediately go on the nose straight away, identify we starward. I mean, I did get that candied banana um, definitely on the nose. That always sort of gives away starward uh, for me. Um, I've been lucky enough to go to the distillery plenty of times. In a previous life, I used to work with Diageo, so they were a distilled ventures partner. So I'd often do tastings with starward. So with the Australia series, it's actually the first time the other night I did a tasting that I'd actually ever hosted an all Australian whiskey tasting. I've done tastings where there were Australian whiskeys, usually Starwood in there. Um, one of the things we used to do is go lobby, um, uh, you know, lobby the government in Canberra, try and put a freeze on excise and often would bring along Starwood and uh, taste a whole lot of the Argeo whiskeys that have Starwood there as a sort of a, you know, local rep, uh, representation. So, um, no, yeah, a, a great expression of Starwood. I mean, recently they brought out the Fortis, um, which this would probably be closer to that. But yeah, great having this at um, no, that extra few percent, that uh, cast strength is quite, uh, quite interesting to see, it, uh, see with this release. Uh, and, and Gareth and Angelo, I know he, he gives a little bit less away than some of the others, um, but any, any goss or, you know, 3 a.m. nightclub stories about Dave Vitale <laughs> you can give for us? Not from me. <laughs> Unfortunately not. Um, we were fortunate, this is going back to Oak Barrel Whiskey Fair 2018, which was actually, we were in the room that you're currently in the room now. Um, and uh, Starwood uh, had a stand, I believe, next to us for memory. And I mean, he could have sent, uh, you know, the marketing guys out to do the show, but he was actually there um, in one of those sessions pouring. I would have loved, to, I would love to spend an afternoon with David um, in, in any business that's going through growing pains and is expanding and, and um, you know, trying to enlarge and needs a bigger site and all those sorts of bits and pieces, um, he's seen a lot and I would love to spend a few hours talking with him one day. Unfortunately, in that situation, we couldn't because, you know, we've, we've got all these uh, customers, very important people, of course, um, that we're, we're trying to get our message across to and, and tell our story to. Um, but, yeah, it uh, would be a great opportunity one day. Um, I, I, isn't he in the States at the moment? Isn't he based in America now or something? That was yeah, quite the, often. He's over on the uh, on the West Coast, isn't he? Up at Seattle, I think. Okay, yeah. yeah. I just had a feeling he was over that way at the moment. But, that was... Um, yeah. Sorry, that show you were talking about was the last show he did in Australia. He, he left a, a month or a couple of months after that. Okay, that well, maybe I said something wrong to him then. Um, but... <laughs> 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 it's uh, no, it, it, it's very, very amazing story, Starwood. Yeah. Um, you, you, you said you went full corny on the tin shed label, Dave. I can see the word corny uh, appearing here as well. Um, uh, it's I not. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty corny on here. Is nothing's going to stop us now? We're there, Starwood bound. Um, yeah. Full spaceship corniness, absolutely. Starwood. It's not as corny as upside down, though, is it? I mean, we, we have a lot of shockingly bad puns and full on corniness on our labels, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, we've got a full spaceship corniness for our, with David uh, and distillery manager Sam. So, nothing's going to stop us now, which is a reference to a pop song from many, many years ago. <laughs> Yeah, space dogs. We have lots of distillery dogs occasionally come up on, on the labels, but we've never seen space dog before. So, uh, yeah, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's another cracking label. It's a cracking Starwood release. I mean, I haven't tasted an awful lot. I mean, I did bump into the Starwood guys, certainly last time I was out, 2019, um, and tasting some of the, the spirit that's been coming over. But um, I think this knocks it into a cocked hat, to be honest, of what they've been putting over here so far. And, what I've been tasting this tasted very very young and this although this is a three-year-old it's got a it's got a certain level of maturity to it um, I, I do remember um, uh, trying Starwood I think for me for the first time might have been at the Malts Whiskey Society of Australia conference at the Hilton in Adelaide 
2014, 2015-ish, um, there was a presentation. That was the first time I'd ever tried Starwood. Um, and, and to be quite honest, I found it had at that stage back then a, a quite a um, significant banana ester in its flavour profile. Um, and it's, um, yeah, well, that's, uh, I'm not, that, not finding that in here at all. This, uh, this is a very different whiskey to uh, the whiskey six years ago, that's for sure. That's a, it's, it's a really interesting point, Gareth, because yeah. that one's been through a few phases. Um, and certainly if you went to the old Essendon Fields distillery, uh, which is about seven, seven years ago now, you could walk through the distillery and that banana lolly ester would be everywhere, let alone just in the bottles. Um, and I was actually lucky enough to be down at Starwood uh, six days ago for the first time since they've redone everything and, and that sort of thing and did a bit of barrel hunting um, and diving. And there was some very, very old stock, um, some double digit stock. And what did it taste like? Oh. Banana lollies. <laughs> 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 it's, it's still out there. But I think for me, the one we're, we're trying here and I'm going to throw to the room, you know, if there's any nods, this is, as Simon, you said, classic Starwood. You know, I, I'm not really sure what classic Kalara is. I'm a little bit more yeah, familiar yeah. with Belgrove and, um, and Iniquity. But this, but like they were takes on the style. This is a very classic Starwood for yeah. me. Because obviously they do champion that Barossa Shiraz cast. So it's not unusual to see Starwood in this sort of cast at all these days. I think their wine cast in particular has been very successful. Uh, but yeah, the Fortis is probably the closest to this that I've tried. But yeah, great at having that extra few ABV and just lots of juicy red fruits I get as well. Yeah, and the, uh, lots. The, the first one to sell out as well. Um, I feel like I'm going to disappoint a lot of people tonight when it gets to the end of the tasting. So I'm going to, you know, death by paper cuts rather than a, a Band-Aid. Um, so yeah, <laughs> this was the quickest to sell out, which means no, there is none left. Mm. Wow. And so... Uh, so Sorry. It sold out pretty quick. I mean, yeah, we, it was our biggest batch um, over here and what we had in the UK. We held the most of Starwood in the UK because we knew um, that people would would pick on that one because they'd heard of um, of Starwood over here. But uh, yeah, it, it sold out over here too. <laughs> and, and I must say, uh, I mean, we all have our prejudices, I suppose, and I'm not a big fan of um, uh, red wine cask. I prefer uh, fortifieds and uh, ex bourbon casks, ex apera, ex tawny, rather than red wine casks. Um, uh, but that's a cracker. I, you know, we we don't use red wine casks, but this is very very nice indeed. Have you changed? Nice. No. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, yeah, no, good. All right, should we try some uh, black gates? I believe we got next black Let's black gate. That. Let's do that. Let's try some black goat. Right, and this one's soft. Let's start with the other one. Start with bottom. We'll go that way. Black goat can go the other way. Yeah. So yeah, these are all first batches. Um, not our first Australians, but these are all first batches. So everything's a brand new label. Eight brand new labels. Um, this is a, another three-year-old. It's from a big, bold ex sherry cask. Released just two hundred and thirty-one bottles at forty-six percent ABV. So Brian and Janice Hollingsworth are the distillers, a husband and wife team in the middle of nowhere in this little distillery inside of their, their house uh, called the Black Gate Distillery, uh, Mendoran in New South Wales, first established in 2009. Um, and just to give you a bit of uh, current affairs, I um, because of that trip to Victoria, I was, I was late getting back into to town on Saturday. So I couldn't quite get there because it's about a six hours drive straight west of where we are right now. But arguably the place to be on, you know, World Whiskey Day, the, the second World Whiskey Day of the year is at Blackgate because there is a very, very big campfire, some blues and roots playing. Um, everyone pulls up in camps. So I don't think we have anyone in the room that made it out there this this year oh, we got yes. one we got one <laughs> because because <laughs> I was going to say most people are still sleeping over the hangover from you know seventy two hours ago because that's the way it tends to happen but um uh, yes yeah, so there's uh, in, Blackgate is very much in the the memories for better or worse there are a lot of whiskey fans in Australia right, right. now 
So I mentioned the distillery is run by Brian and Janice. Brian generally looks after the whiskey and Janice looks after the rum. Um, Brian learnt his art of distillation again from the godfather of Australian whiskey, Bill Lark. And we've, we've got another little Lark on the label here. The, say, the distillery is in the middle of nowhere and it's in a, in a light pollution area um, where great views of the night sky um, appear and it's it i live in a i live in a little village and it is you know, i'm in between bedford and milton Keynes, so two larger towns and the light pollution I, I i spend a lot of time walking out at night in in the prowling the streets um no not like that um but yeah it's dark most of the time in the winter in england and if you want to go out for a walk you go out for a walk in the dark basically and um yeah you don't see an awful lot of stars even though we've had pretty clear nights through the winter and we don't get that there's, there's just too much light pollution I must admit so I'd love to see more of the sky at night um, there's, there's, I, bought the, I downloaded this fantastic app um, on my phone that you can point at the sky and it shows you what you should be seeing there in the constellation and names all the little stars and shows the the little constellations, which is quite cool, especially when you can see a few stars, but the light pollution around here is, is dreadful. But up there, no light pollution, and you can see the night sky, which is what we've tried to show on our label here. The Southern Cross in the corner, the little lark, and then there's the little dashing Frankie, the unofficial mascot of the distillery, chasing emus and kangaroos off the property. We decided not to put any kangaroos on our Australian labels this time. <laughs> This time around, um, we have a matching rum with this label on um, because we bought some rum and Boutique Rum is our sister company. We did release two Australian rums, uh, one from Blackgate and one from Riverbourne. So we have matching labels. Emily Chapel did the, the labels for both. the. It's, a, it's an identical label, um, just a different time of the day. Um, yeah, we, we have a saying here in, in Australia about the Blackgate Distillery and when you go visit, just like no one can hear you scream in space and you can see a lot of space, no one can hear you karaoke at Blackgate. Um, because, uh, <laughs> and then I would like to, again, throw to our uh, chief gossipers uh, who have done a lot of work with uh, Brian and Janice at Blackgate um, and even done some blended malts uh, with them to Gareth and, and Angela. Um, for any sort of, again, goss, karaoke stories, um, but also thoughts on, on this whiskey because um, I've always, like a direct fired still, really late cuts um, in, in the distillation. Blackgate is big and heavy and golden syrup and viscous and syrupy. This is a more polite version of it, if that makes sense. Um, Gareth and Angela, your thoughts? Um, I'd agree with you there. Uh, Forty-six percent. We've drunk a lot of Blackgate. Uh, we've, we've massive fans of Brian and Janice. They're good friends of ours, um, and uh, they're, they're great company. Uh, when they travel around, they have their little uh, their, van. Sort of, their van and Winnebago sort of yeah. set up uh, that uh, Brian's built up. Brian and Janice uh, built up. Um, normally, when we get people come and visit us, they stay here. This is the loft. This is our little room here and um, upstairs in the shed, and uh, except for Brian and Janice, because they always park their van on the rise in front of the house overlooking the river, um, so they get the, the great views there. Um, but uh, other people from Sydney, um, let's see. Um, Crafty stayed a couple of times. Burnsy from uh, Burns uh, Fabrication and Ashland Distillery, um, they stayed a few times. Um, uh, 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 May and Heath Lawrence have stayed here up in the loft um, and Brian has spent time back here in the music section of the uh, of the loft um, after a few uh, drams too many, uh, having a bit of a jam session and then we work out that he's playing an A and I'm playing an E um, and it's not quite getting together but uh, no, it's, it's been good fun. Thank you, Crafty. And same with Crafty. Crafty too. I can't really see. We've got the keyboard down the back. When Crafty gets on that keyboard, he goes bonkers, and uh, he does a great job on that, that's for sure. Um, but Brian and Janice are just great friends of ours, and uh, for years we've been getting together at uh, Australian Distillers Association conferences, and, you know, after a few at the table and you bring a few out from underneath the table, especially stuff, 
and um, it's it's a, effectively it's like we've got to get together and do a collaboration. And we go, yeah, yeah, we'll do that. And after a few years of you know we've got to get together and do a collab, yeah, yeah, we'll do that. Eventually, we, last year we did. We, well, year before last, we said, yeah, let's yeah. do this. And um, and I'm sort of like, well, you know, Blackgate's got a massive cult following. We can't stuff this up. So how do you want to do it? I, I said, okay, I'll send you a few samples of a, of a few peated barrels we got because at that point they had I nothing peated. but peat. And you send us a few. And we wobbled around and they said, well, what do you reckon? And I said, well, I reckon this one of yours and this one of ours are going to go together really well. And they said, do it. And I said, well, do you want to do it? And they said, no, no, we'll leave it all to you. You're, you're, you're the blenders. You, you do a lot of blending. We trust you. And, and you've got it to think about that. It takes a lot of trust yes. to give someone your barrel of whiskey and trust that they don't stuff it up. Yeah. So we were yeah, and, and so enormously for us, um, privileged that they would actually let us do yeah, the blending. Absolutely. So so for Blackgate to say, hey, look, you, you guys um, do that side of it, the blending and the bottling and the packaging of the whole thing, um, and then send our half back, um, you know, that's that's pretty amazing responsibility for us, and that was an amazing collaboration. Um, but it was wonderful in that in that was during our lockdown as well, Yeah. during COVID. So... While we were all separate in between states and having to stay in, this whiskey was travelling the country. When we couldn't. When we couldn't. So yeah. it, Blackgate's um, second Apira cask, second fill Apira cask, yeah. made its way over to Goa where we blended it, we bottled it and labelled it, and then we sent half of it back to them. So it was doing this trek forwards and backwards across mm. the country. Which yeah. um, was really special. It was good. And then uh, that sold out just like blink of an eye. Um, I actually had to send Brian Janice some museum stock of ours because they didn't have anything to put up on the shelf to even show that it had existed. Um, and then in no time, we said, like, well, let's do it again. And I said, well, it's your turn. And they went, no, 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 you do it, you do it. And so they sent another barrel over and we just did the whole thing. The second one was more illy style. It's more like an ILA sort of um, uh, – with Brian and Janice's, I find personally their second and third fill barrels. They that's their, they, they shine. They really shine. Once again, once the oak has pulled back a bit, once the oak has been taken back a step, they really, really shine. You know, their second and third fills really show um, Brian's work in, in spirit. And of course, uh, with all the packaging that we do, um, then Janice uh, pays me by sending over bottles of rum. So. <laughs> <laughs> In Angela's uh, study and Angela's office, there's always a couple of bottles of black cake rum sitting there slowly being demolished over time by somebody. I don't know who. <laughs> um, and um, I, I think Brian and Janice were on uh, the Wednesday Oak Barrel Show. She do the, the show on Wednesday. Scott, I think a few weeks ago, Brian and Janice might have been on. Uh, the um, we, we do Whiskey Roundtable with That's Matt Bella. Uh, yep, yep. Yeah, and so um, by usually Wednesdays are pretty heavy days for us. So by half past seven, we're in our pajamas and sitting in bed, and we've got the whiskey round table uh, on the iPad. And um, yeah, so apparently, according to Brian Janice, we're doing a third collaboration. So we can't wait. <laughs> so it's really good. Um, but fabulous people, you know. Um, we. We would have loved to have gone to um, the World Whiskey Day on this last weekend, but I mean, Cellar Door has just been insane uh, for months and months now, and playing catch up and a million other things. And plus, Angela refuses to camp unless there's a spa. That's her idea of camping. You've got to have a spa bath. It, I'm you know, sure it could be arranged. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, one of these days, we'll get there. Um. Yeah, like there, there's obviously, as, as you say, uh, Garrett, there's a real cult following for Blackgate in, in Australia. What fascinates me, I and mean, particularly in New South Wales, I might add, what fascinates me is, Dave, I dare say this is your first Blackgate because they make 3,000 litres a year. Um, yeah. you know, what's, what's, what's your first impressions of this? I it's it's a cracker, isn't it? Yeah, we 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 did a a video interview with uh, Gareth and um, with Brian and Janice as well, and uh, yeah, another cracking couple sip, sitting there sipping their whiskey and talking about their distillery. That is, I think we took four percent of their annual production in the cast that we bought, which yeah. is which is crazy. But yeah, yeah, it's a cracker. It's it's um, 
It's definitely in my in, in the in the top half of my in my favourites in here, and we'll go through them if you want a bit later on. That my favourites are, are, yeah, because the next one is one of my favourites as well. That's probably number four in my favourite list. Um, the uh, the Black Gate. Mm. Um, just on, yeah, there was you dropped a rumor there. Yes, there is some boutique rum, and Matt Wooler um, has some questions to ask you about why okay. have you inter inter introduced him to that. Um, Matt Wooler, where have you been? You've been some great. Uh, and Andy Bob comments on the Facebook coast to coast top drop uh, with thumbs up, top and drop both in capital. So that's uh, emphasized. Well, yeah, Blackgate is one of and our cellar door. Blackgate is something we always have um, for our customers to try as well. We always keep uh, we have uh, Australian a few Australian whiskies in our cellar door, and there's always a Blackgate in there. Excellent. Um, any, any, any thoughts in the room or on the chat on this one? Um, it's actually, the, the reason why I sort of messed with your order, Dave, is because I wanted to do these side by side and I wanted to do them in this order because thankfully the segue has been made very, very easy for me with, uh, thank you, Gareth, for, um, for doing that. Um, but I think we'll, we'll move on to the, the next one, the, the Flurio, very soon, unless anyone's got a, a comment or a question about that one. Um, and again, we are moving pretty quickly, so feel free, you can, you can leave it there and come back to it in a bit if you want. Um, but I think uh, move, move yeah. on to something that's special to me. Yeah, absolutely. So we uh, are moving on to the Flurio. So uh, Dave, do you want to tell us about the Flurio? Or are we handing straight over to Gareth and Angela? How do you? Want I to think that? we. Yeah, I absolutely love this. It's one of my favourites, which is why I put this in my order at number three because I wanted it to follow the Kalara. But I understand exactly where you're coming from now. Now I know the story and the connection between the. The, uh, the Black Gate and Florida. So yeah, this is absolutely one of my favourites. And um, let's, over to you, Gareth and Angela. <laughs> there you go. You can just sit back and enjoy your dram, Dave. Yeah, I'm going to. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, first of all, hello, Spencer. Uh, it's, been, it's been a couple of uh, 18 months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we we name all of our barrels, all of our whiskies. Um, uh, if you come to the distillery um, in our storage area, um, every barrel has a JD number or government number because you know uh, a, a 220 litre barrel of whiskey holds around about seven and a half thousand dollars worth of alcohol tax at 87.68 per lal per litre. Although that's going to change from July, which is good, um, but. You know, get me a sample out of uh, 154 JD103957. It's like, where the hell is that out of God knows how many barrels? And so we developed very early on uh, for a bit of fun a, 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 a naming system. And our spirit still basically puts out enough to fill uh, one 220 litre barrel or two 100 litre barrels with a bit of leftovers. So when we first started out, we were um, uh, filling uh, octaves or 100, what we call an octave, 100 litre barrels. So we could fill 200 litre barrels per batch. So we started naming all of our um, barrels after famous couples. And so it was a way of tracking. And we would quite often do uh, a, a tawny cask uh, and a, an Apira cask or Australian sherry cask and uh, to, to, to see the difference for that particular batch. And so if you, if you come into our storage area there, you'll see famous couples all over the place. You've got Bonnie and Clyde to B1 and B2, to Romeo and Juliet, Romeo and Juliet Popeye and Olive, uh, you, you name it, we have all these famous couples. Then occasionally, of course, um, the reserve tank would fill up because you've always got a little few litres left over and there were certain days instead of filling two barrels on a certain day, we'd fill three barrels. And to, to signify that one was the odd one out, the third barrel was always named after a psychopathic hatchet murderer. <laughs> so you, you'll, you'll see you come in and you might see uh, I, I don't know uh, Harry and Sally and um, Hannibal mm -hmm. or, or Ted or, or Alex Forrest Alex Forrest who was uh, if you, I don't remember the bunny boiler from Fatal Attraction you know so she gets a mention as well um, and then when we went on to bigger we, we no longer fill 100s the smallest we fill now are uh, what we call Bariks or 220s um, and so the first two twenties we started to fill were um, up to the matriarch. Yeah, so that's the matriarch series. So they were first fill American oak pira casks from McWilliams, and so they're named after all the famous and influential women in our family and their maiden names. 
and then the hogsheads, the 330 litre barrels at the other end of the shed are, are the grandfathers. We keep the grandfathers at one end of the shed, the grandmothers at the other. Um, and so they're all named after grandfathers in the series. Um, the uh, bourbon casks, when we fill bourbon casks, they're always named after American presidents. You know, go get your sample out of George Washington. Um, so we start with George Washington and we're working away. We'll, we'll eventually, we'll stop at, um, at Kennedy. Everything was crap after that. Um, but uh, when we brought in um, those barrels from the Rodriguez Bodega in Spain, which are PX and Oloroso cast, we named them all after famous dogs. So you'll see a line of Ring Tin, Scooby Doo, uh, Lassie, Lassie and, and so on. And so we have a bit of fun there. Um, COVID last year, all of a sudden around um, end of March, we had to go into shutdown. And, and with a distillery in COVID, it's not like a car. You can't just put your foot on the brake and, you know, turn the key and put your foot on the brake. You turn the key off and the thing keeps cruising. You know, you've got things, processes, permits. You've got permits, products you've that got you life. have to move through and exactly. get stable once it is. And once it's in spirit, you still have to start filling barrels. So. And you, you've got to keep going, even though you're shutting the machinery down and, and stopping stuff from coming in. So we were shut for, I don't know, six to eight weeks. But it's like a ship, just because you turn the turn the key off, it, it still keeps coasting. And it was in that time when there was no job seeker, um, you didn't know what the politicians were actually going to do, or job keeper, I should say. And we, we were starting to get a bit concerned. And we could see also on social media, you know, friends uh, in whiskey bars, uh, whiskey bar owners and, and other small independent stores and things going, you know, this is going to affect us quite badly. Um, people being unemployed and that's when we, we created the Barrels of Gratitude series where Angela on her blog um, basically we started naming barrels after important and influential people in the Australian whiskey scene and writing a bit of a story on how they've affected us and helped us and, and stuff. Um, we, we didn't want to leave Scott out so we actually named one after him as well anyway but um, <laughs> and it still has a name on it Scotty. <laughs> <laughs> it's still there and uh, even barrel of whiskey. <laughs> Such a terrible way to work. <laughs> uh, it's all good. Um, and um, so anyway, if, for us, this was, uh, there were two barrels um, in this particular run. There was no, no, no third run. So this was Catherine and Spencer. And it, Spencer didn't quite fit at what we would call a normal... Um, umami Flurio style. Flurio style. He was something a little bit different and special. He yeah. did have... Uh, when you tasted him at cask strength, he tasted older. A little older, a little dusty. A little dusty, a little older, and he had a lovely chalk, almost a chalk mint sort of finish on him as well. Yeah, red tulip finish, yeah. 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 And, and for us, um, all of our whiskey releases are pretty much blended. Very rarely will we do a single cask release. It's very rare for us. We prefer to blend to try and get a, a sort of a consistency. You know, you can go and buy a bottle of Flurio. We hope you can buy a bottle of Flurio and they will be different, but you know there's going to be a family resemblance there that is safe. You're not wasting your money. Um, and we could have back-blended out um, Spencer, but by himself, he was actually really good. And uh, Felix um, keyed in on that one out of the barrels he tried and said, yep, we'd like to have this one. So Spencer went to the UK um, along with another barrel named after my Welsh grandmother. Oh, really? We won't go there. And um, Catherine, the other half of Spencer, because they were both out of run 25, I think. It was quite early on. Yeah. They, were, they were very early barrels. Um, so they were barrel numbers 56, 57-ish, roughly. Um, and Catherine, in the end, after all the years, went into Signal to Noise, which won gold at the American Distilling Institute Awards last, last year. year. And we still have a little bit of signal to noise at Celebrador, and we've just dropped it off the shop because we've almost sold out. So, um, yeah, no, a, a lovely little drop. I hope, hope people like it. But um, we lovely, haven't, delicious. Uh, we, I, haven't, <laughs> I haven't tried this now since uh, pre-COVID. So probably November, no, you know, even, bit, even earlier than then, August, September. I would say this was the last time I had a sip of this. Um, which then has been created into the, this beautiful bottle. And, uh, no, lovely. One of the things we really liked, and um, I know you'll show the label in a second, something special for you tonight, folks. If you, uh, I don't know if you can see <laughs> the, if you can see us two on the label. I can share if you want. Yeah, yeah. Are you in the same outfit? 
<laughs> so we, we went back into the closet and found exactly the same clothes as what you, what you see on the label there. <laughs> uh, I've got a right. jumper and shirt on. Thank you. You have, haven't you? Yeah. She's got the same shirt. Brilliant. That is how good Emily is. <laughs> Emily is amazing when it comes to her, her uh, uh, drawings, her diagrams, uh, cartoons. Sorry. They are fabulous. Yeah. So we, we thought tonight we will put on the same clothes. Uh, I'm going to have to take this off because I've been wearing it all evening. It's so bloody hot under this. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had to do that for you just for something different. I, I like uh, I like to the joke. I appreciate that. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> Superb. Yeah, there's our label there. There's a story. It's, yeah, it's one of my absolute favourites. The, the, the two malts, the Kalawa and this one, um, just blew me away. The Kalawa, really, because of it's two year old, um, but this is just one year old. It's a whiskey. We can call it a whiskey. There was, I love the label story um, with the trains there. And we've got, the, we've got the Southern Cross hidden on the still here as rivets in the swan up, up in the neck there. Um, really because we couldn't have we didn't have any sky left to put it into so we thought we'd hide it with rivets um, as, as, as the Southern Cross constellation there but yeah I'm, I, thank you very much for wearing the same clothes there that's brilliant <laughs> absolutely <laughs> brilliant with, with that particular um, picture we actually had uh, a few years ago um, the train uh, they didn't switch the line so the train so we're we're right on the wharf we're we're a meter and a half above sea level we're still about just off the water's edge um we, we have, have steam trains on one side and paddle steamer on, on the, the other. other so 115 year old paddle steamer we've got a couple of steam trains and in fact the train line the railway line runs through the distillery uh, and we did have an issue many years ago when um the train when it comes through the yard, it tend, generally tends to travel a little bit faster than yard speed because it's, um, it bunny hops a little bit if it's not doing a little bit quicker. And it's a big tourist area. And so the train driver's hanging out, waving to all the, all the people. And you didn't realise that the person, they, they bring the train around to put it in front of the carriages to take off to go to Victor Harbour, where they had a, a turntable. Mm. And he didn't realise that the points had, had been switched over. And so he took onto the third, onto the branch line, that and leads to our shed. Just ploughed clean into the distillery, um, which was a hell of a mess. Um, we actually took out the great big railway door and to fix, we had to actually secure it because the distillery is an underbond area and it oh, did it take a, a while because yeah. it was the middle of Christmas holidays. So we had tourists everywhere. everywhere. We had the shed totally full of people. Uh, and luckily, no one was hurt. Yeah. Um, but, but yes, yeah. it came through with a big crash. Yeah. And um, we're also a brewery as well as a distillery. So people are standing around. Monday's experts are standing around with their pints trying to tell everyone how it should be fixed. And, uh, <laughs> and it actually twisted the chassis of the train, unfortunately, it took a lot of fix. But oh, yeah. So if you come in to have a look at the door now, it's got these great big, I don't know, what steel, are they? Steel. Sorry banded like, things to try and hold the whole heritage door together. It's like a steel iron lung because the door dates back to the 1870s. It's the third time um, the carpenter's looking at it. It's the third time the train has crashed into that door in 150 years. So the door's... <laughs> um, one of the beautiful things that Em did also, uh, if I can bring this up to the camera a little bit, what I'm going to show you here, um, on this side, of course, you've got our picture, and this one is of... Kalila. Notice the similarity? Yeah. <laughs> See that? Still. The two stills, yeah. Um, and that was done uh, very interestingly. When we first um, uh, decided, okay, um, shifting from just being a brewery into also being a distillery, we have a brewing background. Um, I was a fan of Kalila. And um, when it came to building, getting us still built, Effectively, when we went down to Tasmania to talk with um, Peter Bailey from Nat Lua, um, a lot of the stills in Australia being built then, um, personally, I found to be quite short, quite squat. Maybe the, the ceilings in Tasmania are really low. <laughs> um, but where we are in our building, um, we've got 
we got metres and metres. We've got, you know, sky's the limit for us. And so I basically said, and he had a, 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 a massive poster, picture board of all these different stills in Scotland. And I said, you know, well, I am a fan of, fan of Kalila and you've got it there. What I want is a still that when the still is full and ready to be switched on, the surface area or the diameter of the still to the height of the uh, swan neck uh, to, of the neck to the, 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 the angle of the line arm, length of the line arm, all the bits and pieces. I think Betty's the name of the spirit still in uh, Kalila. I said, basically, I want a clone of that. And so at that time, for its width to its height, it was one of the, it will, I think it was the tallest that Peter had built at that time. He's, I think he's gone on and done all sorts of things since then. Um, but at that time, it wasn't your standard squat Tasmanian type still, uh, for want of a better word, it's probably not a very nice way to describe it. Um, but uh, we wanted something more Carly I suppose. And I think um, M had cottoned on to that. And so you'll get this amazing similarity between the two in the label. Yeah. Yeah, based, based on the Kalila label, yeah, we wanted yeah. to get that in because you mentioned that story about you, your first love being Kalila. Incidentally, Kalila was the whiskey that changed my life as well. Good. Oh, oh excellent. Yeah, it was a Kalila that made me sit up and think, bloody hell, why am I drinking more of this stuff? This is yeah. just nectar. And uh, yeah, that's where it all started. One bottle of Kalila. And I still carry a picture of that bottle because it was a single cask release from Gordon, uh, from Cadenheads. Um, my sales manager introduced it to me and I just, wow. Yeah, this is what, I need to know more about this, this whiskey thing. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know what it's like in the UK, but here, at least in South Australia, Kalila is, is much more, I mean, I know the vast majority of what they do would go into blends, of course, and things. But it's a it's a quiet achiever, you know. You don't hear a lot of them. They they're not out there, um, you know, with uh, just screaming with reps and brand ambassadors everywhere. They they're just quiet, you know. They're there, they're stable, they're in the background doing what they do, you know, confident in what they do, and we we think that's great. I was just tasting a new Kalila um, yesterday morning, actually, for something that we've got coming up shortly. And uh, it's, yeah, absolutely glorious. I'm really looking forward to bringing that one out shortly. Um, you didn't mention anything about your distilling regime. You run a pretty long fermentation schedule, don't you? I mean, eight days of ferments. Yeah, so uh, coming at this from a, a brewing perspective, uh, a lot of distilleries, like all gee, I like whiskey, I might build a distillery. We started out originally in 2004 as a brewery. Um, I, I've been brewing all the way back since 1988. It's my first commercial beer. Uh, sold illegally, um, we won't go there, but um, <laughs> it's, um, so we, we started out with a brewing background and um, so so for us, with our regime, it is, I suppose, very traditional or has that brewing hangover to it. So we use um, ale mops, we don't use distilling mops, we don't use Pilsner mops, it's always ale mops. Um, we prefer to use um, brewer's yeast or blending of brewer's yeast and distilling yeast on certain occasions. Um, also, Angela did a, a fair bit of work in looking at using crystal malts um, in, in trying to recreate what malting was like 150, 200 years ago. You know, these days where you go to a maltster, you know, $65 million malting plant and everything's computer controlled and it's stirring away. The analogy I would use, it's a little bit like modern malted barley now is so perfect, you know, for single step mashing. It, it, everything is so perfect. It's, it's like a creamy risotto where I reckon 200 years ago with four maltings and, and less technology, I think the malt in that analogy was probably, it was more like a paella. You know, you had the crunchy bits on the outside a little bit. And so for us initially looking at different malt bills and things came from that. Well, what was malt like 200 years ago compared to now? Um, so we do a fair bit of that in our experimentation, but not over the top. And because once again, from brewers, we know as soon as you add more than 6% of specialty malts, your malt profit becomes one dimensional and dominated by that specialty malt, which I don't like the taste. Uh, in that respect. But yeah, so we do very long ferments um, uh, using our yeast, of course, eight day, eight day ferments, um, which but, gives us yeah. smaller heads, longer tails when it comes to distilling. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, and because we come from a brewer's background, or Gareth particularly, um, 
our malt bills, we really think carefully about what malt bill we're going to use to, to eventually fill certain, certain barrels. Um, because there's no point, for example, using specialty malts yeah. in a first <laughs> filled barrel because the, the barrel. first filled barrel will dominate unless you use a uh, huge amount of specialty malts in there and then it, doesn't it well. becomes unbalanced, I think. Mean. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So we, we do tend to approach things from that perspective um, in, in what we do. Glorious. Absolutely glorious. I absolutely love it. Um, yeah, it, it, I, right from the beginning, before, I didn't even know you were coming on this until this morning. Um, I picked my first three favourites right at the beginning, and the Belgrove Rye, it just blows me away every time, Kalawa and, and, and yours. Uh, they were my first three in the tasting in my lineup. Um, but I can see what you've done here, Scott, and it works really well because I've just been popping up, up, up against each other. And uh, this, was, this was actually from a proper Spanish sherry cask, wasn't it? No. No, this was uh, Australian um, Apera. Apera cask. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I've got I've got matured in a Spanish sherry cask. So it's not. It's an apera. Yeah, it's a pera. So it's Australian sherry uh, back then. Um, mm -hmm. A lot harder to find these days, but you could get so uh, going back uh, 2016, 2017, you could get a pera cask, which was still ex McWilliams held sherry for up to a dozen years. You know, the, the older wood. It's very hard to find the older wood now. Um, and and so yeah, so it's a, it's ex apera. Uh, and I must say, at the moment, just tasting it now, it has less of our signature to it, I think, this particular barrel. It has, we, we, we are known for our umami, pastrami sort of backbone through our whiskies. And, you know, we, we have this real umami, pastrami, meatiness, smoked smoky bacon, pastrami sort of meatiness overlaid with salted caramel. You, you go down into an area we call the pit where we have all the octave, bar octave barrels stored and uh, in wintertime you can look down the barrels, the length of the barrel row, and you can actually see the salt crystals on top of the barrels. Um, we're in a very humid but maritime, maritime environment and the salt air mm -hmm. just permeates the, the entire building. Um, and, you know, there's quite has an effect, I think, on what we do uh, in that respect. We do have that uh, maritime sort of character starting to, to develop in our whiskies, uh, but not so much in this one, interestingly enough. I think in this uh, one is completely sold out over here. Nothing left. Yeah, well, Scotty cornered the market on this one. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Woohoo! Very and gamble that there was going to be a steam train on this label uh, and bought it all. At least all of the Australian um, contingency. Um, but look, look, it's it's. I've got a backlog of comments I want to get through here. But I'm going to pick a couple um, from Mick Laptop, if that is your real name. Uh, <laughs> Glorious um, from Flurio, uh, fa favorite so far. Um, but then also uh, Crafty uh, need to pass on the message that Millie and Billy are still little happy campers, uh, whatever that means in jokes on live streams. There you go. Um, <laughs> but look, I, I think that's that's an excellent release. It was something that yes, we we took the whole Australian allocation uh, for because we we jumped at it. Thought it was thought it was excellent. So this is the one of the times I, I don't need to disappoint everyone because we do have a little bit of this of this left. But I think most importantly, we've taken Australia's two quietest distillers and put it on its head right there. After, <laughs> after about six drams and get them fired up, I think it's good. We got to, uh, I haven't seen you two talk that much in it ever, I don't think. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's great. It's like, oh, yeah. We're already in, in that after party territory, which is great because we still have two more whiskeys to go. So let's kick on in the after party right. with the final two whiskeys. So we're moving right, on. Let's do that. Well, we're coming back to New South Wales. Riverborne is next, isn't it? Yes. Yep. Ooh. So it's a single malt, three-year-old from Richard, American and French Oak. I don't know how that works, is it? I just got to double check on the casks here. Um, American French. So it's um, it's one of these Richard, like like a STR cask over here, but it's um. What do you call it over there? You call it um, roll out the barrel. Roll out the barrel. Roll out the barrel. There you go. 
Um, we, we're always quite a fascinating distillery when we have it at, um, uh, you know, we've had it at whiskey fair and tastings before, and it is without fail one of the most sold whiskies on the day. Um, it has a really bolted on fan base, which I find find yeah. quite fascinating, yeah. which makes sense because I've always found Riverborns are quite distinctive. Um, and I think this whiskey is also, you know, very distinctive at 50%. Um, it's, it's for me, it's, nice. it's really Yeah. One of our smaller releases, this was, I think we only had 109 bottles. So it's in a, in a, in a smaller cask. Um, distilled using propino barley and a, a certain yeast strain, which we've hidden on the label. We're not hidden on the label. We put on the label, uh, SO4 strain yeast. Um, yeah, 50%, just 109 bottles. Um, a distillery founded by Australia. I don't know if he likes being called Australia's oldest distillery uh, distiller. Martin Pye, he's a third generation pharmacist, apparently, who has an obsession with the scientists, sciences. Um, and studied microbiology, biochemistry, chemistry, and mathematics. We bottled a riverborn, a riverborn rum as well. So we have the, the whiskey and a rum with the matching labels here. Um, generally, they use two types of barley um, and the heavily peated Scottish malt and a local malt from Australia. So yeah, your, your peated malt from Australia seems to be coming from Aberdeen or Inverness from what we've found. Um, but they do use a lot of different yeast strains. So they focus on the early stages of the whiskey process is what we've been told. Um, and particularly those flavors made in fermentation. So I guess long fermentations, which which we seem to find a lot with the sort of passionate craft distillers is about these really long fermentations. Is um, Martin, who um, <clears throat> I was just seeing a few few comments, he was actually had his whiskey independently released in Australia under the name Grumpy Old Man on a Hill. Uh, which you know, <laughs> is a moniker that he doesn't shy away from necessarily, um, <laughs> but is a, is a big fan of brewing and fermentation. And, and if you speak to him, he, he talks a lot about that, that art and that process, particularly in the craft world. And one of the stories that we had from this distillery was the, 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 the place is riddled with wombat burrows. Um, and so we thought, well, Wombat Burrows, and we, we, we had this idea, of in, we have a committee, when we, when we create a committee, we have a group of us so passionate about the boutique whiskies, it's not a committee, we just sit and chat around coffee uh, about the new labels coming up. Um, we, we talked about this one and we thought, well, what about a whack-a-mole sort of, sort of thing, you know, at the fairgrounds in, in, in the UK, the old village fights and that we always had this game called whack a mole where someone would put something up and you you'd try and smack the mole and we thought we'd do the same sort of thing on this label but with wombats uh, the other thing that we know about this distillery at riverborn is all of his releases are named after the born series of books movies um i had to google it sorry um i don't watch tv I don't, I don't watch TV. Uh, life is too short for TV and most of the shit that's on TV is absolute garbage. I carry around a picture of the Frank Zappa. I'm a huge Frank Zappa fan, um, Frank Zappa and Beef Up. And there's this great uh, album cover. Hmm? Uh, wouldn't have been able to pick that one. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> there's this great picture of this toilet that's just flushing down straight into the back of a TV. And that's how I feel most TV is these days, is just garbage um i just can't stand it i can't stand the dumbing down of everything these days you know whenever they're telling about a story they've got to show a picture of it like i don't know what a pint of beer looks like or anything like that it just ugh. so I, i've turned my tv off in fact i saved myself so much money that i can thought well i'll just spend that on whiskey i haven't i, I cancelled all my subscriptions before lockdown and i haven't switched the tv on it's wonderful release it's a wonderful release. So yeah, this is all named after the Bourne series of books. There's a huge amount of books. There's a, a couple of movies, I don't know. Um, so we've got this redacted and that's something big in the movies apparently that everything's redacted. I have no idea. Um, so we've got these little wombats there and they're all in the burrows <clears throat> and they've stolen everything from the distillery because he's actually found them in the... Um, Sheds used for maturation there. So we've got all these little wombats dressed as 
military sort of feel to it. There's the bad guys. Um, and we, we, we've named the, the malt on the barley there. We've main, named the yeast on the, on, the, uh, on the label there. Oh, excuse me. I'm just going <coughs> to cough there. Um, but there, it's a, it's, uh, the rum label looks very, very similar, just slightly different colours. And obviously we would have changed some of the swag underneath there into rum swag rather than whiskey swag. But it's a cracking release, I must admit. It is an absolutely cracking release. It's all gone over here. Uh, I just—I was actually just checking stock while we were talking. Um, obviously, being a, a small release, it was one of the first ones to go here. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure Scott wanted to actually do a few more sample packs to send yeah. out, but we weren't able to because this uh, went so quickly. We're, we're at this capacity because of this release. Yeah, we were. Yeah. You know, I, I had extra lined up of everything. Um, this was the one that I didn't have to sell, let alone full sets to sell another 30 tickets to, to this tasting, which sold out very quickly. So, um, yeah. Um, I think uh, you're yeah, quite interesting. And I think this is a particularly interesting one, like a few of the others where this is gonna be a lot of people, even in Australia, their first first experience with the distillery, uh, which I think is which is quite interesting, and it's and for me it's again a quite a quite a classic, um, which is a less than subtle segue into the the final whiskey tonight, mm -hmm. because uh, for a lot of people in Australia this will not be their first introduction into Bakery Hill, but what it will be is almost certainly their first iteration of Bakery Hill, such a, a famous distillery in his, well modern historic distillery in Australia in the sense of independent bottling and, and outside the control of, of David and, and Andrew Baker. So um, I know that uh, Dave, you, you mentioned your, your favorite three. Uh, we, we've probably done my, my, my favorites, um, which was obviously the, the Flurio, um, but I'm pretty sure neck and neck, this is, this is up there for me. This year, if not my top one, this is very, very close. Yeah, this is definitely a a star in the lineup as well. And I put this up again. Last time I did the taste and the other the other morning, I went on and put this up against um, an Ardmore, and uh, the, I put it up against a ten year old ten year old or fourteen year old Ardmore. I can't remember which one I grabbed from behind me over there. So everything behind me is as many boutique releases as I can fit in that cabinet and there's lots in there but I've got a couple of Ardmores in there and I put it up against an Ardmore and it stood up to it easily um this is obviously our first ever batch from the Bakery Hill Distillery it's a five-year-old peated single malt matured in an ex-bourbon so this is actually from um an ex-Jack Daniels cask uh, full five, matu five years maturation in a 200 litre ex bourbon barrel made using Highland style peated malt sourced from the maltings in Inverness. So, exactly the same peated stock of malt that would go to somewhere like Ardmore. Um, and uh, yeah, it is. I mean, I could slip this into a tasting um, over here. And I, you know, when I do whiskey tastings and whiskey clubs, I like to peel all the labels off and um, put new labels on. I put standard labels on. I think I've got one down here. Yeah, I saw one. I knew I saw one. So I make little labels with our old um, brick wall, boutique brick wall, and I put the Whiskey Club logo in the middle, and I just name, number them Whiskey Number One, Whiskey Number Two, Whiskey Number Three. And I reckon I could slip that in and people would be convinced that was an old Ardmore, or maybe it's even got a little bit of that sort of Tobermory or the Chig sort of vibe to it as well. I just think it's a cracking example. Um, I know they, this is Australian whiskey and it's, it, it's, I think when they first started, they wanted to prove a point. And certainly David wanted to prove a point that great single malt whiskies could be made outside of Scotland and specifically in Australia. And he certainly has gone and done that here. It's just five years old, um, great little color on it. It's, it's not really dark, but it is quite golden for a five-year-old. Um, I'm not sure if that's a first fill X bourbon cask. I normally see a first fill take on a little bit more nuttier color than that over, over here. But um, this has got one of the most amazing labels on it ever. Um, I'll show you that in a minute. They absolutely wet themselves when they saw this label because 
David and Andrew. David Baker is an ex-high school chemistry teacher. Um, and we've got this thing that he broke bad and set up a ma mainland Australia's first whiskey distillery. And certainly people laughed at him when he first said he was going to set up a whiskey distillery. But this has been going for a little while now, 20 odd years. Um, it's, it's one of the distilleries that we do see over here. Everything that we see over here is single cask. I think that's all they release generally is single cask. Uh, everything over here is in little slim 50 CL bottles, uh, which is something that we always bottle everything for Boutique at 50 CL, uh, really because some of the batches are so small and we just want to share the love. Um, really, that's what it's all about. So he was inspired. Oh, that is sensational whiskey. That is lovely. Absolutely delicious. That is a really nice drop. That's 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 a corker. I uh, mm. uh, the, the blending part of me would love to go through the underbond uh, area of Bakery Hill um, and also of Blackgate and do a Blackgate Bakery Hill batting. Surely, surely you can make that happen. Oh, I'd love to. I'd love to. <laughs> well, we certainly want to send Felix back to Australia as soon as we can. Um, because we'd love to do a second. I mean, it's gone, we knew it would go down well because we've got, a, you know, we've got a, an army of whiskey fans over here that believe in what Boutique do. Uh, and, and, you know, they haven't heard of these distilleries yet they've sold out over here, really because they understand what Boutique whiskey are all about and it is, is bringing great whiskies to, to the market, um, which is, you know, you know, there's only two distilleries that most people over here would have heard of. You know, Starwood definitely, and maybe a few of the extra geeky ones might have seen Bakery Hill on the Australia page on a few online retailers. It's not something you see in a whiskey shop as an independent whiskey shop. It's not something you see Australian whiskey. Um, and so for our whole series to sell out as quickly as it did, we definitely need to get back. <laughs> At the risk of rushing things, we have about uh, two, two minutes to go, which is which is interesting because we're 28 minutes over time. Uh, so I'm actually just moving the goalposts a little bit because I'm so in things. So uh, let, let's let's get this label up on screen. Um, let's and then do that. After party mode. Oh yeah, we we we've gone through uh, we've gone through a Breaking Bad theme on this label. And apparently that's a very interesting TV program that you may have watched. Um, as you know, I haven't watched it. Um, so we've gone for that Breaking Bad theme, which is about a science teacher making drugs. But um, we've set it up in the Australian Outback, Winnebago, full of whiskey casks. And that's David and Andrew, Andrew in the hazmat um, suit there and he's stamping on a miner's license now originally we wanted this is sort of the start of it's a very historical reference to the Eureka Eureka stockade in 1854 at a place called Bakery Hill which is where the inspiration for this distillery name not only the their own surname but this historical place in Australia and it's the beginning of the the independence of Australia and I, I originally wanted to have a Union Jack being stamped on there as it was a little bit of a stamp on this, this Eureka stockade was a bit of a stamp on the stamping on England. Um, but legal took that off and we ended up with the miners license there. Um, we have that, yeah, we have the Ministry of Fun called the legal department who do vet all of our labels. Early days, they weren't vetted uh, and we got into trouble for a few of the labels. Um, now we have a legal department that do look at it and question everything. Um, we did get into trouble with, with some of our early releases, certainly from the SWA and, and from the Portman Group because of our labels being this, um, not we, we don't say cartoon, we say graphic novel style um, label. But uh, yeah, we've been into trouble a couple of times and we've had to change a few labels over the years. Um, but this, I, I just love this label. Uh, they loved the label when they saw the draft and said, they couldn't stop laughing when got they are, they are really embracing this label so if you follow um, Baker Hill on Instagram uh, David and Andrew have been posting uh, shots of bits of their faints and of course it goes that bright blue colour um, that uh, was uh, from the copper sulfate that um, no, obviously it was famous in the TV show the, the myth that, uh, that they were cooking so 
Um, yeah, well worth uh, um, checking out their uh, their Instagram. Uh, for their proudest punch about it. Um, they they have uh, managed to secure quite a few bottles that they're selling via their cellar door as well. Um, yeah, it's um, yeah they're doing a great job there. I, I think uh, when we've waited twenty years, you were twenty one, twenty two years for independently bottled bakery or simply. There have been a few in existence, you know, Gillies Club, you know, which is a list of big whiskey club in Australia. Um, they, they do exist, but in, for the general public, uh, this is really the, the first part of the jury. I think it's it's an exceptional, exceptional reason, an excellent way to um to, to, to finish. Um, and there is, I think, one question coming in from Regan, who is um, one of the true believers that has gone the whole way with it. So thank you very much. Um, any sneaky clues to the next Australian releases? Are there extra barrels from these distilleries? Is, uh, ah. you know, are you going to buy a Zoom scratch and sniff to buy some more, or what's going on? We definitely would love to do a second Australia series. Absolutely. Um, it's something that we've been talking about immediately after releasing this because of the re reception that we've had. I mean, we've, we've definitely been fans of Australian whiskey uh, because of, you know, fortunately, I was a whiskey blogger and was invited into lots of different places in, in the previous role as, as a blogger and, um, yeah, whiskey enthusiast but um and and got to taste lots of new australian whiskies and we you know we 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 understand that there's okay we know we we know it's not everything is great just the same as in scotland not everything is great but we don't see any over here because we know that europe isn't your market you know if you look at australia as the center of the map we always seem to think that um you know england is the center of of Europe sort of thing. You know, the people in England seem to think that England, um, uh, England, England is the centre of the world. Well, it's not the bloody centre of the world. Uh, there's a lot of other places. I used to live in the Far East for a long time and I know what the market over that side is, is like as well. But yeah, we'd love to get some more Australian whiskies. We did buy a few additional casks of Australian whiskey while we're down there that we haven't released with this series that we have in mind for other series. But yes, uh, a second uh, Australia um, series is definitely on the cards. Um, while we can't travel at the moment, I don't know when we will be allowed in and out of Australia, but we can do things online and talk to different distillers and hopefully some distillers will be approaching us. Yep. Look, it's, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, thank, thank you, Dave, joining us again. Uh, Gareth and Angela, your insights and uh, particularly uh, gossip into other Australian distillers has been excellent. Um, Simon, for, for wrangling this whole beast of a thing and making this salmon and, and dodging things, um, it's, it's been excellent. So, um, so thank you very much. Any, any final thoughts from yourself, Simon? Uh, no, no, I think we've covered quite a lot. Um, I was going to see if there were any last questions, but we've got Dave in the audience. Well, uh, what, what, we'll hold that to the after party. Yeah, what we might do is we, we might <laughs> say goodbye to um, the people on Facebook and, and YouTube. Um, but before we do that, if you want to um, hold that mic up so we can get the full effects of the, of the crowd here, um, to give a big round of applause to Dave and Angela and everyone. <laughs> Oh, it's great seeing Gareth and Angela here this evening. Absolutely superb. Cheers, Dave. Yeah, thank you. Good to see you too. <laughs> um, we, we will say good night to our friends on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, and if there's any more questions, we can ask them before Dave has to do a full day of work. We all get to go to the pub. Um, <laughs> so thank you for joining us. And for those in the Zoom, give us give us two seconds and we will we will be with you soon. So thank you very much.